Morning, everybody. When I was asked what the choice of the song I wanted uh, to play when I walked up, and my husband said, why not in the old Iron Butterfly song, In Agata De Vida? I said, oh, I'm sure they've used that a million times at De Vida, and it turned out they hadn't. I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So it was supposed to be that song when I came up. So uh, this is the intellectual part of the morning. And I'm going to go over some recent papers from 2011, 2012 that really have implication for home dialysis. Some of these uh, I chose and some were chosen uh, by the uh, medical directors uh, at DaVita. And they're all my take on this. I haven't had any kind of input uh, from anybody else. So I'm going to talk about some specific uh, publications related to PD. I'm going to talk about dialysis to transplant and back again and the role of modality there. And then a couple of interesting studies that came out, one on uh, intermittent hemodialysis, the FHN home dialysis trial, and then more on survival comparisons between hemo and PD, although Raj Maotra will be going into that in more detail. So this is the first paper I just want to address. This is the BOLD study, B-O-L-D-E, which was a quality of life study in the elderly patients who were on either PD or in-center hemodialysis. And these patients uh, were matched to in-center hemo, uh, about 70 patients in each group, and they certainly were uh, in the elderly category. And what I want to show you is that first SF12 PCS is the physical component sh uh, score, which is the other one is the mental component score. And uh, there was no difference between PD and in-center hemo for the physical component score, but there was an improvement in the mental component score, a significant improvement in elderly patients who were at home on PD compared to those who were in-center hemo. And moreover, except for the physical component score, which stayed stable, the difference in quality of life parameters between PD and in-center hemo became even more different over the first year of therapy, with PD uh, staying better and patients, the elderly patients on hemo, getting worse in their quality of life over that first year on hemodialysis. And this particular uh, slide dovetails very nicely with what Alan Nissenson said. So these are elderly patients, and this is the illness intrusion index. So how much does your illness and its therapy have an intrusive impact on, on your day-to-day -day living and your quality of life? And you can see that despite the fact that it's a home therapy, and as Alan said, people who would say, oh, why do you want to burden old people with home-based therapy? that in fact you forget about with in-center hemo that these same old people are being packed up and shipped off to the hemodialysis unit three times a week. And not only the travel, but the recovery from hemo and all that, such that in the end there was less reported illness intrusiveness with PD than there was with the in-center hemo. So my take on this and why I want to bring up this particular paper is that uh, very little PD is being done in the elderly in the United States. And the elderly people like to stay at home. And uh, it's a simple way to keep the elderly in the home. Indeed, and I know this is uh, for the future, but a financial case can be made that it's actually cheaper, it costs less to keep the elderly at home especially on peritoneal dialysis, than it is for them to go to in-center hemodialysis, including the six trips a week, uh, back and forth, three times a week hemodialysis. So this was an interesting study. It confirmed Alan's impression that, in fact, elderly people and PD are a very good mix. And so please don't dismiss out of hand the idea of home-based dialysis for your elderly patients. I've got about half a dozen patients in my program who are over 88 years old. My oldest patient is 93 and is still on home-based peritoneal dialysis. And let me tell you, it's better than shipping them back and forth to an in-center three times a week. This is about residual kidney function, which we know is very strongly associated with uh, survival uh, and nutritional outcomes, both in peritoneal dialysis and also in hemodialysis. Uh, 
And this particular paper looks at the rate of decline of residual kidney function in PD patients who go on to Cycler compared to those who are on CAPD. This was done by the NECOSAD, which is at the Netherlands Cooperative uh, Dialysis Center. Uh, the 38 dialysis centers across the Netherlands collect their data and it goes to a central processing and analysis place. I always find the statistical analysis very complicated in these, uh, in these studies because it's done by a full-time biostatistician and it's very difficult for me to understand it. But in this particular one, they wanted to say if patients go on Cycler versus if they go on CPD, is there a more rapid decline in their residual kidney function? So they followed this over an average, a maximum follow-up of three years. You can see that they had more CAPD patients than they had Cycler, which is the opposite of, of what it is in the US and Canada. And there were some differences at baseline. The CAPD patients were more likely to be on an ACE or an ARB compared to the Cycler patients. And there is some evidence that ACE and ARB therapy may help to prolong residual kidney function in patients on peritoneal dialysis. And the APD patients were more likely to use icodextrin, whatever impact that might have on residual kidney function. So there were these differences at baseline. But you can see that in the unadjusted data on your left, that CPD patients appeared to have longer preserved residual kidney function compared to those on uh, Cycler. And when it was analyzed with and without icodextrin, it was the same result. Uh, so patients who were on Cycler had twice the risk of losing their residual renal function compared to those on CAPD. And uh, interestingly, this was most pronounced in patients who started with a higher, not a lower baseline GFR. So this just adds to the already very confusing collection of studies that have looked at that. I've listed for you many of the studies that found no difference in rate of decline of GFR between CAPD and Cycler, but there are a few studies, including this particular one, that would suggest that there is a faster decline on Cycler. There are no studies that I'm aware of that show an, a faster decline on CAPD compared to Cycler. So there are either no difference between the two therapies or a faster decline on APD, to which I've just added this particular uh, study. Now you're probably wondering, what would it be about going on the Cycler that would lead to a faster decline in residual kidney function? Well, some have argued that APD, given that you're getting most of your therapy uh, bunched together at night, is more intermittent and therefore more like hemo. And we know from many studies that the rate of kidney function declines faster in hemo than it does in PD. So maybe APD is a little bit more like, like hemo than like PD. Also, if the ultrafiltration is occurring at night when perhaps the blood pressure is lower, maybe that compromises renal perfusion and accelerates the rate of decline of the function. But it may also be confounded by indication and perhaps sicker patients are being put on Cycler. This really isn't clear from the study, but we do know that sicker patients tend to lose their residual kidney function faster. So that's why it's still very confusing. As I've shown you, the literature is really mixed on this. I really don't buy this intermittency argument. I think APD is still PD, and I don't think it's a lot like uh, hemo. The actual slope or rate of decline of residual kidney function in this particular study, there was no difference between the two groups. So like I said, the statistical analysis is confusing to me. It was also disproportionate in that the majority of the patients were on CPD with only about 70 or so patients on the APD. And my own take on that is that if I wanted a, a, a patient or if I was discussing with a patient, and as so many of our patients do, they're very attracted to the idea of cycler, I wouldn't not put them on a cycler for fear that their residual kidney function is going to decline any faster. Okay. So now uh, from dialysis to kidney transplant and back again to dialysis. This is an old study uh, and it was from Tony Blyer 
And what he looked at is the following. If patients receive a deceased donor kidney and they come from PD versus if they come from hemodialysis, is there any difference in the kidney transplant function? And what he found was that there was less delayed graft function if a patient received a deceased donor kidney from PD than if they did from hemo. There was no difference in rejection rates between the two modalities, and in fact, at one year, there was no difference in graft function when the patients came from either modality. But it was an interesting observation about this redu reduction in delayed graft function. So this is uh, another study that followed from that and used more data, and uh, they found that indeed there was less delayed graft function when the patients were transplanted uh, from PD, also an, a lower risk of recipient death, and uh, not only was there less delayed graft function, but unlike Blyer's study, in the end, at one year and afterward, there was better graft survival if the patient was transplanted from PD compared to hemo. If you go way back to the very early days of, uh, of peritoneal dialysis, there were some case reports that patients who were transplanted from PD had a higher rejection rate because they were made more immunocompetent by PD compared to the old cellulose acetate hemodialysis where patients were chronically underdialyzed and perhaps less immunocompetent. And there was a worry that maybe PD patients should not get kidney transplants because of the higher risk of rejection. So now we see a sea change where starting with Blyer study and then this US RDS data, that in fact it looks like the patients, if anything, have better graft outcome if they're transplanted from PD compared to hemodialysis. Not only did Tony Blyer find this in the US RDS, but these are studies that came from Europe that confirmed this observation that there was less delayed graft function transplanted from peritoneal dialysis. So that leads to this uh, newest study that uh, Raj was involved with, and it looked at, again, kidney transplant outcome based on the modality of dialysis. So this looked at the first renal transplant in this particular uh, registry, and they looked not only at graft survival, but also at cardiovascular events and patient survival. And here's the results, if you look at the top left, that's patient survival. Interestingly, if patients were transplanted from PD, they seem to have better survival compared to if they were transplanted from hemo. Cardiovascular survival is even more dramatic on your top right. And you can see the very different uh, cardiovascular survival rates between those coming from PD and those coming from hemo. And then graft survival, which sort of started all this off with the studies I showed you before, there was a little bit of an advantage to being transplanted from PD, but it certainly wasn't as uh, dramatic as the uh, patient events and the cardiovascular events. Uh, the authors then went on and did a propensity match cohort, because again, you might say, well, you know, it's a different kind of patient on PD than on hemo, and maybe it's that different kind of patient that predicts these outcomes and not the modality itself. So they did propensity matched, and what I want to show you is that patient survival now is not so exciting, nor is graft survival, but again, the cardiovascular survival, that is freedom from cardiovascular events, was very different between the two. And at least in my reading of the paper, and maybe Raj would want to comment when he comes up, there's really not an easy explanation for this. Uh, I didn't want to talk about it because it's really last year's news, but this whole idea of myocardial stunning is very interesting. The idea is that your hemo patients who drop their blood pressure, and uh, when they drop it transiently and the nurse changes their position or gives them an infusion of saline or, or shuts off the ultrafiltration, they have these transient episodes of hypotension that we don't think too much about but studies that have been done from the UK that actually scan the heart of hemodialysis patients during these episodes of hypotension find that they get regional wall motion abnormalities, or what they call the stunned myocardium.
And it looks like these episodes of stunning, which had happened in some of our patients three times a week on hemo, can lead to adverse cardiovascular outcomes. And whether that myocardial stunning in hemo, which doesn't occur in peritoneal dialysis and probably doesn't occur with daily hemodialysis, uh, affected the difference in the cardiovascular outcomes when these patients finally had a transplanted kidney is unclear. But leave it to say that you can see this dramatic difference in uh, the cardiovascular events when they were transplanted from PD compared to hemo, even when their propensity matched. So once again, you know, there was a, 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 a reduction in delayed graft function, but when it was adjusted for, there was no significant difference in delayed graft function. And as I said, there isn't any really obvious explanation for these interesting uh, results. Once again, it could be that healthier patients are coming from PD to transplant, and it, the adjustment simply couldn't capture that difference in the nature of patients. Okay, so that was dialysis to transplant. Now you have a patient who's transplanted and has a failing allograft, and they're going to have to go back to dialysis. Does it matter what kind of dialysis they go to? And again, I, there's a feeling that once they've had a failed renal allograft, that they can't go back to peritoneal dialysis. And there are some very cogent reasons for that, as Dr. Williams, who's our patient speaker, will, will perhaps tell you about. But on the whole, is it worthwhile to say that uh, a patient with a failed renal allograft should go back to one versus the other modality? So this was uh, Canadian uh, data. Again, patients coming to dialysis after their first renal transplant uh, failure. And it was also analyzed by ERA. Interestingly, over the ERAs, less patients with a failed renal allograft returned to PD than they did to hemo compared to when the data was first collected in the early 90s, perhaps reflecting this discomfort with failed renal allograft patients going back to peritoneal dialysis. Nonetheless, the survival of these patients going back was almost identical between whether they went back to hemo or PD. Interestingly, the early survival advantage that has been described for peritoneal dialysis was not seen in this cohort, but you can see that the uh, survival is almost overlappable. So these are sort of my take, take home messages from the di dialysis to transplant and back again. No randomized controlled trials. There is a signal for better graft outcomes across multiple studies, across different eras, across different countries if the patients are transplanted, deceased donor transplant from peritoneal dialysis. I never personally thought that a run of hemo just before receiving a kidney transplant was such a swell idea unless the pre-op potassium was eight or something like that. And that run of hemo just before a renal transplant perhaps uh, uh, jumps up the uh, immune system and just makes it a little more jittery uh, in terms of, except that's a very non-medical explanation, but uh, in terms of the ability to not reject um, a, a brand new kidney. The new data suggests also not only better graft outcomes, but better patient outcomes uh, um, when they're uh, transplanted from PD compared to hemo. When a patient comes back to dialysis after a failed renal allograft, they have obviously had a long duration of ESRD. They were usually on dialysis before, got a transplant, got lots of immunosuppression, and now the allograft has failed and they're back on dialysis. Compared to a transplant naive patient starting in your dialysis program, these patients should be considered a little more high risk because of all those uh, events that have preceded them. Nonetheless, at least from this study, it looks that there's no difference uh, in outcome whether they come back to PD or to hemo. Okay. Uh, the background story for this particular study is uh, looking at patients on PD who are rapid transporters. And there was a long history that patients who are rapid transporters do worse with both increased technique failure and patient death uh, uh, compared to patients who were lower transporters. 
So most of these patients, when all this, uh, these results were found, were actually on CAPD and not on cyclodialysis. So it was postulated that these rapid transporters did worse with less graph, uh, sorry, with less technique survival and less patient survival because they were rapid transporters, they had faster dissipation of the osmotic gradient, therefore they had poor ultrafiltration and they were chronically volume overloaded, they lost more albumin into the peritoneal dialysate, so they were hypoalbuminemic and for all those reasons, rapid transporters did worse on CAPD. However, with the increasing use of APD, and this particular graph is from, from my program, with APD rather than CAPD, there didn't seem to be any evidence that rapid transporters did worse compared to less rapid transporters. So maybe the story is a little bit different with cycler dialysis than with APD. So the Australians have got this uh, ANS data registry. And they reported that uh, rapid transporters did do poorly on PD, even in the more common era. And therefore, they wanted to know, well, you know, these rapid transporters who are doing poorly on PD, it, does it matter if, whether they were on CAPD or APD? So they decided to drill down a little bit on that, and that's what this uh, paper is. Again, you can see that the majority of the uh, patients were on CAPD compared to uh, APD, and they were a little bit different. The cycler patients were five years, uh, they were a healthier group. They were younger, they were less likely to be diabetic, and they were less likely to be from uh, indigenous uh, cultures, which uh, in the Australia registry have got a worse outcome. So here's the results, and it, it showed that in fact, rapid transporters did worse on CAPD than they did on APD. So on both univariate and multivariate analysis, the death rate for the rapid transporters was, was less on APD than it was on CPD. And when they analyzed it a bunch of different ways, it, uh, it persisted. Interestingly, what they also found is that the low transporters had the opposite result. So the low transporters did better on CAPD than they did on APD. So the authors suggested that the beneficial effect of APD for rapid transporters are due to the short dwells that occur uh, overnight with better ultrafiltration. However, for the slow transporters, these short dwells don't allow enough time for significant solute flux. And that's why the, the slow transporters should not be on the rapid cycles associated with APD. So the conclusion of this paper was that they recommended cycler for rapid transporters and CAPD with the longer dwells intrinsic in CAPD for the slower transporters. Well, that's very interesting, but a little bit reductive. And you know, if you have someone who's a rapid transporter and they seem to be absorbing fluid really easily, you say, I know, I'll put them on APD because I can give them lots of short dwells overnight and they'll ultra filter. And that's absolutely true. But what do you do about the long day dwell? So if someone's on a cycler for eight hours overnight, you still have to figure out what to do with them with the 16 hours of their day dwell where they're not going to absorb all that and more that they happen to ultra filter overnight. And there are a few studies that suggest that APD patients, because of that long day dwell, are more chronically volume overloaded compared to CAPD patients. It was also unclear from the Australian study which patients received icodextrin. Also, rapid exchanges are not good, as I mentioned, for slow transporters because it doesn't allow sufficient time for solute exchange. But nonetheless, I find it hard to swallow that that would explain a higher death rate in the slow transporters. I just, uh, even if there is less solute transport, I can't believe that that would translate into a higher death rate. So I think that you can't just reductively say rapid transporters should go on to APD because in fact, uh, you know, they may end up even more fluid overloaded if you don't handle the long day dwell correctly. Nor should I say that the slower transporters um, should only go on to CAPD. I think that's very reductive too. Both of these need some thought and planning.
At the beginning when a patient starts on, on dialysis and they have a lot of residual renal function, it probably doesn't matter what you do. But it's only when they lose the residual renal function that you really have to think these things through. So for example, if you do have a slow transporter, and let's say you talk with them and they want to do the cycler, you could do something like let them have a last fill during the day, some sort of one midday exchange, and then do less rather than more cycles overnight. So John Moran mentioned about a default of four cycles. Perhaps for the slower transporter, it would be more reasonable to give them just two or at the most three cycles overnight so that they're intrinsically longer dwells and allow more time for solute transport. So especially that second regimen with two daytime exchanges and two nighttime exchanges is a lot like CAPD, except it's on cycler. And the patient, though, only has to do one midday exchange and then go on the cycler where they get one exchange overnight. But at least that gives them nice long dwells. So I don't think you can be so prescriptive and say one type for one type of patient and another for another patient. Again, you have to talk this over with the patient and see what kind of uh, PD modality they want to do. This was a very interesting study uh, that didn't really address home dialysis per se, but I think it's got marked implications for home dialysis. So this is Rob Foley's study that looked at the interdialytic interval and the uh, incidence of events. So they looked at whether the rates of adverse events up to and including death or hospitalizations are higher on the day after the two-day interdialytic period. So is it higher on Mondays for a Monday, Wednesday, Friday patient or on Tuesdays for the other uh, kinds of patients? So they looked uh, at this with a, a lot of different data. And you can see it was a pretty representative uh, group of patients with a typical average mean age, a typical distribution of the patients. Interestingly, about a quarter were dialyzed with a catheter. And over uh, the mean of a couple of years of follow-up, first of all, it blew me away that the overall death rate was 41% over two years. It's really quite uh, dramatic. And you can see the incidence of uh, hospitalization for heart failure and other kinds of cardiovascular events. Perhaps not a surprise to anybody in this room. So the meat of it is this particular uh, graph. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, the big arrow is pointing to HD1. That is the first day after the, inter, the two-day interdialytic uh, time. So that would be Monday for a Monday, Wednesday, Friday patient, for example. And then on the y-axis, you see the rate events for different kinds of things, cardiovascular events, infectious events, overall events. And you can see that it is higher certainly where the big arrow is pointing, that is on the Monday or the Tuesday, compared to the other two days. Okay. And this is hospitalization, and the same thing. It's interesting uh, that the highest rate of hospitalization is after the long interdialytic interval, but interestingly, on the day, day three and day five, there are also little peaks of hospitalization. And that probably has to do either with the hemo process itself, or just a patient's been sick at home on Tuesday, they come into the into the unit on Wednesday and they've got pneumonia or they've got cellulitis or something and they end up being hospitalized. So those were the little peaks at day three and day five. But you can see that the biggest peak is on day one for all these, especially the cardiovascular events. So there are limitations to their study. They can only say the death or the hospitalization on the day of hemodialysis day one, not whether it occurred before they got dialysis, during dialysis, or after dialysis. The other really interesting thing is that this relationship did not hold for patients who were on hemo in their first year of hemo. And uh, it was postulated that perhaps they had sufficient residual kidney function that the difference, the long interdialytic uh, time, didn't make much of a difference because they continued to pee over that uh, long interdialytic period. Again, you can't really tell from the study. Okay, so. You know, this wasn't a home hemo uh, paper, but indeed, I think it's got a lot of implications. To me, it just reinforces that three times a week, hemodialysis is very 
unphysiologic. You know, we don't diagnose insulin-dependent diabetes in our patients and put them on insulin Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We don't diagnose hypertension in our patients and put them on antihypertensives three, three days a week. It's uh, very unphysiologic, and although it wasn't really addressed in this paper, I think the backstory here is that it's a very powerful argument for the unphysiology of three times a week hemodialysis. This is the frequent hemodialysis trial, a very interesting study. They originally planned to look at three times a week conventional in-center hemo versus nocturnal hemodialysis six times a week. They had terrible problems with recruitment to the study, and therefore, and again, one of the themes here is you can't randomize people to home versus in-center. Home people want home, in-center people want it in-center. So they changed this to a home versus home trial. So patients were all home-based, and they either received conventional three times a week chemo at home or nocturnal six times a week at home. They figured to find differences that they were looking at, they would need to recruit 250 patients. And again, even though this was a home versus home change in the plan of the study, they were only able to recruit less than half about a third of the patients that they needed. So already this was a, a very troubled study because of the under recruitment. Furthermore, only three quarters of the nocturnal patients actually adhered to their prescription. So again, more compromises in this study. So what they found was that it was essentially a, a negative study for what that's worth. Uh, the main goal about left ventricular mass index or survival, no difference between the two different uh, home groups. They both had improvements in, in their physical health composite, and maybe that is because of the improvement that patients feel when they move from in-center to home, but that's speculative. There was a trend to more access uh, interventions and problems with the nocturnal group, but the nocturnal group has been shown before in our unit and others had much better blood pressure and phosphorus control. So as I said, the problems with this study was the failure of recruitment and the very small sample size. Not everybody finished the 12-month study. And something else that muddied the water was that there was a lot of residual renal function. 50% of patients had a urine volume greater than uh, 500, and therefore it's going to blunt any further beneficial effect of doing more or daily hemodialysis compared to three times a week hemodialysis. So, you know, it was a great idea to do this study, but there were just too many problems that beset it to draw much of any kind of conclusion from this particular study except that it's really hard to recruit people, certainly to a home versus in-center uh, study. So there are cat people and there's dog people. And uh, you know, some people want to do their dialysis at home and other people don't. Our friends, uh, the NECASAD, tried to do a randomized controlled study looking at in-center hemo versus peritoneal dialysis. And once patients were educated on the two modalities, they essentially all refused to be randomized. About half the patients wanted in-center hemo and half wanted peritoneal dialysis. So you can't do these kind of studies because there are home people and there's in-center people. And I personally, just my own plea is I'm getting a little bit uh, sick and tired of left ventricular mass index as the big outcome in these studies. And again, John alluded to this, but more important things is how patients are feeling, what they're doing, are they able to carry through their activities of daily living, and everyone gets their knickers in a knot about left ventricular mass index, and uh, I just find that a little bit boring. Okay, finally, I want to address uh, two studies that looked at the following. There's much that has been made about the early survival advantage of peritoneal dialysis over conventional hemodialysis. And it's always said, is it because there's something particularly good about PD in the early days, for example, preservation of residual renal function, or is it something particularly bad about hemo in the first few years? And of course, urgent unplanned starts, which tend to go way more to hemo, and the tunneled catheters. So there are two papers from Canada that address both these questions.
So the first one is this interesting study by uh, Rob Quinn and his colleagues. And what they did is they didn't look at survival of PD versus hemo. They looked at the survival of PD versus planned start hemo. And this was in an Ontario, which is my province, uh, database. And they looked at elective hemo starts versus PD. So that takes away the unplanned start aspect of hemodialysis. And what they found was that <clears throat> when you compared PD to planned start hemo, there was no early survival advantage for PD. So that was kind of interesting. And also there was no late survival disadvantage to PD. So really in the end, the survival between, un between planned hemo and PD was essentially identical. And also for people who say, oh, you know what, PD becomes worse than hemo after three years, I'm gonna take all my patients off PD and put them on hemo, that there really was no justification for that kind of philosophy. I don't think there's any justification for that anyway, but this would suggest that you don't have that late survival uh, disadvantage of PD, although you don't have an early survival advantage for PD when you're talking about planned starts on hemo rather than crash starts. And why might that be? Well, <clears throat> if you look at all the other studies, which is the top line, you've got PD versus all comers in hemo. So of course, you're gonna have the sick, urgent start hemo patients with lots of comorbidity dying off. And it's only the people who survive in hemo who are left in the end, and maybe those survivors account for the late survival advantage of hemo compared to PD. Whereas in this particular study, when you're looking at planned start hemo, you don't have those uh, crash start patients dying off, and you're just comparing the same patients all along, and there's no difference in survival all along. So that was one of the two studies. The other one looked uh, this time at a Cross Canada database at PD versus hemo patients starting with a, a central venous catheter versus hemo patients starting with either a fistula or a graft. So again, this is uh, looking at the early survival advantage of PD. Is it because of something good about PD or something bad about hemo? So we dissected out the patient starting hemo with a line versus fistula with a graft. So we had a sizable number of patients uh, starting. The vast majority of, of patients started hemodialysis with a catheter, and that's really one of the shameful aspects of dialysis in Canada, is that we have about an 80% start rate in hemodialysis with a catheter, which is the second worst in the world. Worse only than, uh, the only one that's worse in Canada is Belgium, in terms of starting hemodialysis with a catheter. Now those who started uh, on, on PD, uh, uh, sorry, these uh, patients who started hemo with a catheter were also sicker patients, perhaps uh, not surprising, more comorbidities comor and so on. And the results are, I'm, pre I'm presuming you can guess that, that the hemo patients who started with a catheter had a much higher mortality compared to the PD patients. And this goes for if they were adjusted or unadjusted for comorbidities. Hemo patients who started with a fistula or a graft, again, very similar to the planned start hemo patients of Quinn and colleagues, had the same mortality as PD patients. So again, there was no early survival advantage for PD when you compared them to hemo patients who started with a planned access. And indeed, over time, hemo patients had a better survival compared to the PD patients. So on your left is the unadjusted uh, data. That top line is either PD or hemo with a fistula and a graft. And the bottom line is the hemo patients with a catheter. And then with the adjusted data, you can see that it's pretty similar for a couple of years, but then uh, the hemo patients with a fistula or graft do better than the PD patients who do better than the hemo patients with a catheter. So does that mean, you know, we really agonized over this. Are people going to assume 
that, you know, if everyone had a fistula, then that means that they would live longer than patients on peritoneal dialysis. Well, you know, as you know, the patients who start hemo with a fistula are a very special group of patients. And I think just the ability to have a successful fistula earmarks a patient who's got good protoplasm and is going to do better on hemodialysis. And we are in the study comparing that good protoplasm kind of patient with everybody who started on peritoneal dialysis. So does that mean that everyone should start dialysis with a fistula to maximize survival? Well, first of all, most importantly, it's not all about survival. And I wish people would stop uh, looking at the minutiae of survival. As I've said, there's more to living than simply not dying. As I said, the plan star patient, the patient with a graft or a fistula, reflects our healthiest, most prepared hemodialysis patients. And we're just dreaming in technicolor if we think that we can start all our hemodialysis patients with a successful functioning fistula. And I just show you Laura Denber's uh, study of clopidogrel at vascular access patency, not to talk about that, but to say that the fistula failure rate in this particular study was over 60%. So, you know, the idea of starting all our hemo patients with a fistula is, is just uh, a dream. So those are, I think, some interesting papers from last year and the early part of this year. Just to summarize the important points, I believe that PD is really underused in the elderly ESRD patient, where it associates with a better quality of life, and I can speak to that. Elderly people do not like to be packed up and shipped back and forth to a hemo unit. They would rather have the dialysis in their own home. I think the literature remains mixed about whether cycler PD causes a faster decline in residual renal function compared to CAPD. Patients who are transplanted from PD seem to have better graft survival, and this newer data would suggest better patient survival, reduction in cardiovascular events if they're transplanted from PD compared to hemo. And when the allograft fails and they come back to dialysis, there's no difference in survival whether they come back to PD or come back to hemo. There's increased morbid and fatal events, hospitalizations, cardiovascular events, after the long interdialytic period. I'm sure this won't be news to anybody in this uh, audience. It confirms our own experience, your own experience, and many previous studies. This kind of three times a week dialysis regimen is very unphysiologic. With regard to the home part of the frequent hemodialysis network study, it was underpowered, had a number of difficulties to it, and the real take home message from this is that you can't randomize patients to a dialysis regimen. Uh, for some, home is best, for some, in center is best, and you can see it was even a problem to randomize them to home three times a week versus home six times a week. And as I said, I think enough already with left ventricular mass index as a, a, an important outcome marker. And finally, much of the survival advantage that's been purported with peritoneal dialysis may actually be a survival disadvantage of hemodialysis, particularly the crash start hemo patients and those with the catheter. And when patients are on PD are compared with patients who are either planned start or with a good access in hemodialysis, survival is essentially the same. So again, I've had enough with this, and I hope it's time to move on from our obsession with these uh, differences in survival uh, between the two groups, but not until after Raj's talk. And then usually the best modality for a patient is the one that is chosen by the patient after they've been educated. And I think that's the most important take home message at all. Thank you very much.